Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This year's Nobel Prize in Economics has been handed out to former U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and two U.S.-based economists, Douglas Diamond and Philip Dipwick, for research on banks and financial crisis. Bernanke examined the Great Depression of the 1930s, showing how dangerous bank runs when panicked savers withdrew their deposits can be. Diamond and Dipwick showed how government guarantees on deposits can prevent a spiraling of financial crisis. When the world economy is weighed down with instability amid the pandemic and heightened geopolitical tensions, how could the laureates work on the triggers of financial havoc help us? How can we best deal with today's economic challenges? Now, let's have our panelists. For the latest discussion on the Nobel Economics Prize, we are joined in Shanghai, Dan Wang, Chief Economist of Hansam Bank China, in San Francisco, Nicholas Economize, Professor of Economics at New York University's Stern School of Business. First of all, what kind of message is the group of prize winners being selected this time uh, likely to give us about what we are thinking these days of the global economy. Dan? I think the biggest lesson is when we're in a deep uh, economic downturn like this, the Keynesian style of economics start to become prominent again. And we need to not only pay attention to the use of monetary policy, but also have to watch out for the bank's performance and try to prevent a panic. As long as we can prevent the panic, then the banks will be fine. Mm. Professor Economize. Well, the way I would see it is kind of a slightly different question is why why are the Scandinavians giving a prize to these economists right now? And I think it's because uh, the Scandinavians don't like the tightening that is happening right now from the Federal Reserve. And Bernanke was the one that gave us uh, free money, uh, zero interest money for a long time. So. Uh, I see it that way. Uh, now, these uh, are very distinguished uh, economists who long time ago uh, discussed how to prevent uh, bank runs. And that's kind of essentially their contribution to economic uh, literature. Mm. Of course, uh, among the group, uh, very different. One, of course, uh, uh, Bernanke, Professor Bernanke has been a key uh, academic and later joined the Federal Reserve as the chairman even during the uh, global financial crisis in 2008 and later dropped out of politics and uh, joined the academic circle once again now with the Brookings Institution. The other two gentlemen are mainly academics. They've been working on the societal impacts of the banking sector. How do you see the two uh, very different uh, directions yet being grouped together this time by the economic surprise? Bernanke is a, kind of an exception for a Nobel Prize winner. Most Nobel Prize winners never had any government experience. Uh, but he played a crucial role. He happened to be Fed chairman at the time of the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And uh, he pushed for the quantitative easing, another way to say a very low uh, interest rates. And uh, at the time of the crisis, what he did was very good, innovative, solved the problem, averted a much bigger crisis. But unfortunately, his uh, successors kept the zero interest rate money much, much longer than it was necessary. And now they have to increase radically the interest rates. Uh, if, uh, let's say, three or four or five years ago, they had increased the interest rates then there wouldn't be a problem uh, right now. Things could be much, much smoother right now. Well, I thought Bernanke did a good job during the 2008 financial crisis in his response because of his work after the 2008 financial crisis. Now the role of the central bank has been greatly extended. Uh, the authority has also been enhanced. And that's essentially why we see this kind of unprecedented monetary response after COVID under Jeremy Powell's watch. 
The latest uh, policies coming from the Fed is very controversial, to say the least. Uh, uh, different opinions coming from the investors, from the financial companies. Now, then, how do you see the debate that is going on right now? The impact is not just within the United States, it's globally, since the, the U.S. dollar is still the most crucial currency. Well, when we're in economic uncertainty like this, uh, investors all rush to safe assets, uh, which are mostly dollar-denominated assets. It makes sense. And it looks like that uh, when it comes to commodities, there is some kind of diversification away from uh, using dollar to pay for commodities. But for other type of international transactions, it looks like it's really hard still to challenge the dollar supremacy. Uh, I don't think it is that controversial of, uh, for the Fed, Federal Reserve's policy response. Um, because when we look at the real interest rate, it's still quite negative. That means it just has to increase interest rate until somehow bring the inflation down, maybe in a year or two. Mm. Uh, Professor Economize. Well, it, it's um, given the present level of inflation, um, there would be a need for a huge increase in interest rates uh, to bring it down um, to the levels that have been discussed this far. I think uh, we hope that inflation number is going to be much better in November and December so that this increase of interest rates is going to stop. Because if it really doesn't stop after the end of this year, we will have a recession for sure. And a recession is exactly what we want to avoid. So we want to be able to get not to have a recession, but at the same time, interest rates to go down. And this is kind of a tightrope. I mean, yeah. it's not easy to do both. But um, right now, unfortunately, the whole job has fallen on the Federal Reserve because the government, Congress in the United States, keeps spending as if we don't have a problem, as if we don't have inflation. So that's a problem. Uh, it would be much more prudent for Congress to spend much less right now. There has been debate internationally about the role of the Fed right now and the policies, the nature of policies uh, it is making. Uh, for example, uh, one part of the debate suggesting, well, the supremacy of the U.S. dollar is not being challenged at all at this moment. The other part of debate is, uh, yes, the fact is there is a still U.S. dollar supremacy. And, and as a result of that, the U.S. Fed uh, decisions uh, needs to be uh, very much not just looking at the U.S. The domestic uh, um, advantage, but also looking at the global picture. After all, uh, the U.S. is a very crucial player in the global economy, uh, particularly the inflation pressure is being felt in other economies uh, times more, some say, uh, than that of the United States. Now, uh, Dan, how do you see the two sides of this debate? Uh, with the fact that right now we are having a uncertain picture about how we see the world. Uh, I do think the current difficulty is partly caused by globalization, because previously when the markets were more separated from each other, there are countless smaller banks. Uh, and that in a way is a diversification of risks on its own. But when the 2008 financial crisis happened, people have realized how important it is, the Federal Reserve's policy uh, for other countries' monetary policy. Actually, it's precisely because of consolidation in the banking sector. Uh, when the information could flow like that, it doesn't make sense for a country to have multiple small banks instead of bigger banks thrived. So now if one place has a crisis, especially the U.S., it can easily to be spread uh, to spread over to other continents. So the debate now about whether the Federal Reserve should implement their policy uh, is quite an important one. But the more important uh, thing is to realize that we actually uh, are in this world highly dependent on what America is going to do. Mm. Professor Economize. Well, I think that um, very unfortunately right now there are a lot of uh, big and independent uh, risks. We have uh, the war in Ukraine, which creates not only 
the small probability, but still a probability of, uh, of total catastrophe, a nuclear war. Uh, there is um, the bad effects on Western Europe. Uh, there is a good chance that uh, irrespective of what happens in the United States, there will be a recession uh, in Germany and other parts of Western Europe. Uh, there are There is the problem with the inflation that we have already and we have been discussing here. I would not put kind of long-term emphasis on dominance of this or currency or, or that currency. I think these are things that change. If the various dangers diminish, let's say if we have uh, peace in Ukraine, uh, if um, the flow of natural gas comes back to Germany uh, from Russia, uh, things can be different. But at this point, unfortunately, we have all these big risks. Professor Economize, uh, well, the Nobel Prize is being awarded to these three economists. What are some of the lessons and also takeaways emerging and developing economies should have right now, uh, particularly uh, when uh, their voices is not necessarily equally heard on the international stage? These, uh, these economists uh, who, got, who got the Nobel Prize today uh, focused on banking and in particular on ways to avoid bank runs in which everyone's trying to take his or her money out of the bank at the same time. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, the United States uh, implemented policies to create an insurance so that uh, there will be no bank runs in the future from 1933 onwards. Uh, and of course, the developing countries should do the same uh, for their own banks. Um, now, these economists did not go deep into the issues of um, international trade or um, globalization and so on. So there's nothing I can get from them. But I think that generally speaking, uh, globalization has been a very positive trend. And that's my opinion, not, not the Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> globalization has been a very positive trend in the world economy. And um, uh, at the same time, the it has created conflicts, it has created populism and unrest in some uh, countries. And uh, we, on top of everything else, have this present war. So this is, you know, we were, we were, we thought that we were pretty happy a couple of years ago <laughs> when globalization was raining. Now it's different. It's quite different. Uh, one big lesson for the emerging market is how dangerous the housing market can be. Um, because according to Bernanke's work, when we're in an economic downturn, the housing market specifically can work as a financial accelerator, making the recession longer and more severe. Uh, and I think that has huge implications, especially when it comes to the policy um, implementation in China. When we look at the deleveraging efforts in China, it has been quite consistent. Even during the most difficult time after COVID, the policy was never reversed. Uh, and the main reason was that when there was a, a price drop in the housing market, usually the lending um, that are using the housing assets as collateral will become more risky. Then the banks would ask the borrowers to pay back money earlier. And that itself can create this downward spiral in housing prices, which in turn cause a bigger recession. So for China's economic response, it seems that the Chinese government is focusing on this particular issue, actually uh, the foundation of which uh, was laid out by Bernanke's work in early 1980s. Very interesting. Thank you so much for both of you for your analysis. Dan Wang and Nicholas Economize. Appreciate it.